I'm the history guy. I have a degree in history and I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. Between the 1810s and the 1830s, the indigenous Maori people of New Zealand engaged in a brutal set of internal wars. These wars cost thousands of lives and changed the politics of the islands, and they forever changed the trajectory of New Zealand's history, especially in terms of their later relations with European settlers. And while there were no European combatants in these wars, it was contact with Europeans that drove much of the carnage, and they teach us valuable lessons about what happens when cultures collide. And those are some of the reasons why the largely forgotten and misunderstood New Zealand musket wars deserve to be remembered. The island nation of New Zealand lies some 900 miles to the east of Australia. The archipelago consists of two large main islands and hundreds of smaller islands, and because of its remoteness, it was one of the last lands on Earth to be settled by humans, with Polynesians coming to the island sometime in the 13th century. And there they created a unique culture that is called Maori culture. It is a stunningly beautiful and complex culture with amazing works of traditional art, but it is also a warlike culture, a culture where warfare was considered a perfectly appropriate cultural response to any perceived crime or slight. The wars were fought with traditional Stone Age weapons, like the short-handled club called a patu, or the long staff called a tiaha. They tended to be highly ritualized, and they caused very few casualties. And the winner might win territory, or booty, or slaves, or just status, which was called mana. While Europeans discovered the islands in the 17th century, there wasn't regular visitation until around the middle of the 18th century, usually from things like whaling or sealing ships who were seeking supplies. It was then that the Maori started to trade things like fish and water and cloth made from flax for European goods like metal tools or potatoes which hadn't been known on the island before, or more alarmingly, firearms. Muskets did not immediately transform warfare in New Zealand. The th first muskets that were traded were poor in quality and few in number. The first known battle between Maori tribes, including muskets, the 1808 Battle of Mora Manui between the Ingatiwatua tribe and the Ingafui tribe, resulted in the defeat of the Ingafui, whose warriors had a few muskets. But the battle showed the Ngafui the potential for the weapons, and so they acquired more. The start of the musket wars is often attributed to the Ngafui chief, Hongi Hika, and the cause was reprisal for the loss to the Ngatiwatua at Mora Manui. Hongi Hika used clever strategies to acquire more muskets. For example, he allowed Christian missionaries on his land under his protection, and while the missionaries would not sell him weapons, their presence made it more likely that that would be a port of call for other ships who would. In 1820, Hongi Hika accompanied a missionary all the way to London, England, and there he was given gifts by King George IV. On the way back, he stopped in Sydney and traded the king's gifts for more muskets. More muskets meant more victories, which meant more slaves, who he could then use to raise more crops, which he could use to support his army in the field, and which he could use to buy still more muskets. Eventually, other tribes would acquire muskets as well, and the musket wars became New Zealand-wide. And as everybody got muskets, it became harder and harder to achieve quick victories. The Mori Ori, who were the pacifist indigenous population of the Chatham Islands to the east of New Zealand, were nearly exterminated in the Musket Wars. The relatively stable boundaries between tribes changed significantly, and entire areas of the islands were depopulated. The number of casualties in almost two decades of war is difficult to account for. There was no clear record keeping. But between the musket wars and the diseases that came from contact with Europeans, the first half of the 19th century saw the native population in New Zealand reduced by some 40%. Thousands more were enslaved or displaced. There are some historians who argue that the introduction of pigs and potatoes had a significant impact on these conflicts as the introduction of muskets. These new sources of food allowed surplus, which allowed you to support more soldiers out on a campaign. 
there's some undoubted truth to the claims. The introduction of things like tools and potatoes can have unintended consequences, just like the introduction of muskets. But the name The Great Potato War is just not as compelling as The Musket War. The musket wars weren't exactly unique in world history. Early contact with Europeans frequently caused conflicts and ripple effects that would sometimes roll far beyond anyone who had actually met a European. But the impacts were more severe and immediate in New Zealand because of the unique way that Maori customs and cultures interacted with European weapons. And the impact of the musket wars would have a huge impact on the future of New Zealand. It would allow in the missionaries who would change New Zealand's religion. It would lead to large-scale European immigration and eventually to conflict between the Maori and the Europeans, the New Zealand government, for nearly 30 years, from the 1840s to the 1870s, in what was called the New Zealand Land Wars or the Maori Wars. But in a broader sense, we should also remember the musket wars because they're largely forgotten, and largely forgotten because they occur in the pre-colonial era. And for far too much of our understanding of history, does history only begin when a European shows up and starts writing things down. And we really need to preserve these oral histories and understand what came before. Because the more we understand history, the more we understand ourselves. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy then please go ahead and click that thumbs up button that you see there on your left. If you have any questions or comments, or if you'd like to suggest another topic for the History Guy, please write that in the comment section, and I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of forgotten history, then all you need to do is click the subscribe button, which is there on your right.